Okay, so take three. Go. Hello, Mr. Christ. I just want to let you know I'm sorry I can't make it today. I've got a vasectomy and, uh, you know, hopefully I'll see you next time. But I want you to know when you're as handsome as I am, sometimes you need these sort of procedures. But before I go, I just want to sing you a little song. It goes, mashed potatoes are great. They are great to have with every single meal. Go with everything, chicken, pork, beef, whatever you like. They are fantastic. And I'll have them tonight for dinner. No, I hope that you have a fantastic interview with the friendly men and uh, hopefully catch you next time. <laughs> This is amazing. This has been two years in the making. I am here sitting with three lovely guests. I'm sitting here with my friend Baron, the drummer of the Death Warrant. Say hi, Baron. How's it going? That's great. We have Anthony from Ant Reviews Things. And, and we have the one and only, the original guitar player of everyone's favorite band. We have Danzig's original guitar player, John Christ. John how are you doing, buddy? This is amazing. How are you doing? I'm almost perfect. I made it. We're here. Let's do it. What have you been doing these days with the COVID and the COVID-19? I know you're a guitar teacher. I know you worked at universities. What have you been doing during this COVID time? Well, besides getting COVID twice, uh, I've found some time to practice. I started teaching online Zoom lessons. Um, and uh, starting to put things back together, you know, reach out to some of the old fans, some of the old players, starting to create the network again, um, revive some of the old days, you know. Um, and I've been, been playing a lot of guitar, been playing a lot of mandolin, been playing some banjos, some ukulele, some bass guitar, uh, you name it. We've been playing it and, uh, you know, it's time to whip it out. Well, John, I just want to tell you something. If you are ever in the Chicagoland area, that guy, Barron, will back you up. He knows all four albums on drums from start to finish. He's been, he's an incredible drummer. We jam. You can name a song and he'll play it. He'll play it. <laughs> like, right hey, now. Here, Barron, go play him a song. I'm not going to play the drums right now. His drums are right over there. <laughs> it's gonna, it sounds Literally, like... his drums are right over there. Well, yeah. so it sounds like... Um... All we need is a short guy who can sing. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> By the way, John, you have no idea. I've been looking at your face for 10 years on that man's wall right there. And I'm that sorry. exact poster. No, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, John, just tell us a little bit about like how you originally got involved with Sam Ann and Danzig. Well, it's interesting. You should ask that. You know, I just recently got back in touch with uh, a friend of mine from high school and uh, his name is Tim Moore. And he, he and I grew up playing baseball together in Little League. And uh, then, you know, we started hanging out again in high school. And after we graduated, we went our separate ways. Um, and I saw him one fall, he was riding his motorcycle down the street. I was raking leaves. He pulled over and said, hey, I'm working in an architecture yeah. firm downtown Baltimore. And uh, these, my boss's son is a drummer named London May. And he plays. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. He plays I love a, London. Yeah, he plays in a group called Sam Hain. And he said, and they got a couple albums and all this stuff. And um, they're up in New York, New York, New Jersey area. And they're looking for a guitar player. And I was like, nah, 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 I'm studying jazz at Towson. You know, I'm all sophisticated and snobby. Thanks, but no thanks. And then, so that was uh, probably summertime. He came back, it was right around thanks. No, it was, it was, it was Christmas. It was right before Christmas. And he said, hey, that group is still looking for a guitar player. And they got a pending deal with CBS, but they need a guitar player to complete it. And he said, and the singer was in the Misfits and Rick Rubin who was producing then at then it was just LL Cool J and the Beastie Boys. That's all, you know, you only had a couple of artists out at that point. 
And uh, so I, I'd heard of that, you know, and I said, all right, so, you know, send London over. He came over with this other guy and they were head to toe black, you know, pasty white skin, black lipstick, black fingernails, tall, thin, skinny guys. And I'm sitting there in my torn up blue jeans and a ripped up Iron Maiden t-shirt. <laughs> so, just going, who are these guys, you know? And uh, so they, they wanted to hear me play and, you know, see what I could do, you know, and I was, I forget, I was, I was playing stuff like, um, you know, Ted Nugent. Yeah. You know, I was playing rock and roll stuff and he's going, yeah. okay, right, this guy can play. And uh, he goes, you know, what we're looking for is we're looking for somebody who can play this kind of punk metal stuff, all down chopping. And we got a record deal. We just need a guitar player. You know, <laughs> Rick Rubin doesn't like the guitar player. So I said, all right. So brought me a cassette. I learned some of the stuff. The mixes were pretty bad. I didn't know it till later that I insulted Glenn by saying, man, I don't know who mixed this shit, but I can hardly hear the guitars are so buried in the mix. So, it's funny you did that, huh? Yeah, that's how we started our relationship. And, uh, you know, that kind of tension went went through the whole thing. But um, so anyway, long story short, we set up an audition, went up for that. Uh, it was uh, it was just after Christmas. So was this in 87 or 88? This was, I want to say it was 86. It was oh, 86. wow. 86, yeah, because it was about a year before the first album came out. So okay, right. it was Christmas time, 86. Um, the auditions were 87. Because I remember I was going back to school. I was a junior and I was a, a jazz comp major and I already had my dorm room and everything. And I was like, I need, you know, they want me to come back for a second audition. And I said, hey, Glenn, call me back, man. You know, I need this audition. Otherwise, I'm going to go back to school. And he wouldn't call me back. So I started putting the telephone in front of my Marshall stack in my bedroom and uh, playing stuff like Halloween. Yeah. You know, and I would play, this was before digital stuff. So there was a tape on the answering machine. So I would play for like 20 minutes until all his tape ran out. And then I just kept filling up his tape machine and then saying, call me back. I need to try out, call me. And eventually he finally called me back. And he's like, hey man, you got to stop, you know, leaving messages all that long. I can't get any of my other messages. And I said, well, you called me back, didn't you? I got your attention. So, <laughs> We set up the second audition. He told me, he said, you had a good audition, but you know, we do everything down chopping. Everything is, is down picking like this. It's like, uh, you know, it's really fast. Um, and I was doing alternating stuff. Gallop type of stuff like Iron Maiden. He's like, no, it's all down chop. So I had to completely relearn it. And the audition, I was playing so hard and cramping up that I ripped the nail off my index finger and started bleeding all over my guitar and my strings. And I brushed up against Glenn. I left six bloody lines on his shoulder from my finger. Bleeding. And Rick Rubin just thought that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Dan thought I was doing crystal meth or something, you know, but I was just I was just getting into it because I didn't stop. Yeah, I mean, there was blood all over my guitar. I left it there for weeks, you know. <laughs> and I, I think that's probably what got me the gig. So I, did, I get the audition. Glenn comes in. You know, we're playing. And he says, all right, that's enough. He, he clears the room. Uh, I wait for about five minutes. He comes back in by himself. And he goes, you know, you interested in the gig? And I'm like, it was at one of Aerosmith's rehearsal studios, uh, 28th Street in Manhattan. Okay. Uh, yeah, they had all this gear. I can't remember the name of the Top Hat Studios, I think it was back then, where they filmed the uh, Walk This Way video with Run the MC. Oh, nice. oh wow. Yeah. wow. So Glenn said, yeah, you want the gig? And I was like, sure. He said, OK, I'll be right back. He came back. Everybody, the band came back in. We started working on Mother that night. Wow. 
So I went yeah. back, I was staying at London May's house on a futon on the floor in the living room. And I had to call my mom and say, hey, mom, I got the gig. Drop me out of school. I'm not coming home. <laughs> I was 21 years old, 21 years old. And you that was my it. goal to get a record deal by the time I was 21. So now at that point, did you know that you were auditioning for Danzig, the band, or this was Sam Hain that you were this was Sam Hain. This was Sam Hain. There was yeah. no intention of ever changing the name. So when did that come about? That you just that that the, was that Ruben that wanted to change it to Danzig, or so this is where rock and roll gets ugly, right? So I'm sleeping on London May's floor. Don't get me wrong, London was is a great human being. Okay, um, as soon as I got into the band and we got rehearsed, it, it started sounding like a band. Mm -hmm. uh, and but Glenn and and especially Rick, they they weren't crazy about london's feel for timing okay his, his groove there was something about it that didn't like london and i went to rehearsal studios we bought special time we practiced we did everything we could he was taking lessons in new york city left and right you know just trying to make reuben happy didn't work out uh i got a call one night and it says hey john don't say anything but we're getting a new drummer. And I'm like, well, I'm sleeping on the old drummer's floor. What do you want me to do? He said, no, don't say anything. Just uh, we'll tell you when and where the tryouts are going to be. So Erie Vaughn and I met Chuck Biscuits, hung out with him, and then went to a rehearsal studio in New York. And as soon as we started playing, it was like a bomb went off in the room. Yeah. yeah. You know, looked at each other and we're like, well, that's different. Yeah. You know, so my guitar, his bass, and and Biscuit's drums was just like you know I'm getting chills right now, just thinking. Can about I ask that. you a quick question, Mr. Christ, John, Mr. John? You can call me John. Shut up with John. Him. Okay, okay, John. Uh, Chuck Biscuit sat really high up on his drum stool. Do you think yeah. that helped or hindered? So it wasn't a drum stool; it was a bar stool. Oh, that's why it was so tall. Okay. <laughs> So the thing was, when you stand up or nearly stand up, it's physics. You, you can get maximum right. force on the kick drum pedal. And he used a wooden beater like the old punk rock drummers. Right. So and one he's a problem, prolific drummer. He was in, you know, D Black Flag and DOA and all that. So I didn't know, like, so what his record yeah. was. And all that stuff. And he had a propensity to snap the pedals in half because he was almost standing on them. But like he, his feel was almost standing up and just having this, the ball of his foot on the pedal. And that's yeah. where he likes. And he liked to be up above the drums. He didn't like to have to lift his arms and elbows up to get over the drums like some of these guys that are sitting on a, a half keg or something. He wanted to be up higher so he could play down. It works. And beat. Yeah, and I like that chopping of the, you know, he's chopped that symbol like that, like sitting up all high and he's just he's and cutting down a tree. And like two of his four symbols, no, three of his four symbols were all different size ride symbols, not crashes. Right. Yeah. And he used huge sticks, you know. And uh, when you watched him closely, um, and if we did a long session, his set would be there would be sawdust around the outside of it oh, yeah. <laughs> nice the, the wood coming off and the blisters on his fingers it was he would duct tape them up it was it was disgusting so quick question when was the first actual danzig gig like what year and where was that so that was the trenton city gardens new jersey i have a picture of that um trenton i man i i want to say it was august baron do you know no, maybe April 88, I'm thinking. It's, I think it was in April, yeah. I think it was April 88. Yeah, and, and it was a weird club. Uh, and it was fun because we rented all this backline gear. I mean, we were playing. We had two or three Marshall stacks, and we were running all the cabinets. It was so freaking loud. You couldn't hear anything. And, um, you know, I had gotten a, a Les Paul or two by that point. And it was a weird place. The dressing room was upstairs, but you had to walk downstairs through the crowd to get to the stage. And all they wanted to see was Glenn. You know, it was, oh, Glenn, Misfits, Misfits, you know, and all that. 
Um, and we were doing this thing where, you know, Glenn and Rick Rubin were really into uh, WWF wrestling, it was called at the time. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. Erie and I would dump water over our heads and baby oil. So we, when we were head banging, oh, we were throwing God. spray everywhere. And, you know, you get two, two strokes on a guitar pick and you have to grab another one. You know, you couldn't hang on anything. But and we were head banging. And I'm still feeling the results of that today. But uh, yeah, that was Trenton City Gardens. And then the idea was, you know what, let's just do a couple warm up gigs because we wanted to do the Ritz in New York City. And that was a big gig. So this was a warm up to get some of the butterflies out and work out some of the chops and figure out what we had to do to get tight. Wow. So here's a weird question, John. What was the weirdest thing a fan Listen, has- Listen, all of your questions are weird, all right? Can we just- <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, man. All right, well, here's the question for you. What was the, like, the most weirdest thing a fan threw up on stage while you guys were playing? Like, did they throw like goat's heads or like, you know- Well, you mean stranger than actual throw up? Um, <laughs> I, I would have to say I, I would have to say one of the, the funniest things ever thrown up there. I mean all the typical stuff came up there but when we were doing a Halloween gig at a place called Irvine Meadows, California and White Zombie was opening up for us, they were throwing pumpkins at us Ooh. so we were dodging and ducking pumpkins and you know that Mother 93 video? Yeah, yeah. sure where you see all the people crouching down and all that kind of stuff. And we're playing a million miles an hour. Um, that, that was, that was a Halloween show and they broke the barricade. That's why security was crouched down on the front of the stage. If you look on the cover of that uh, Thrall Demon Sweat Live CD, you can see mm -hmm. Jesse James crouching down with a white, white beater shirt from the back. You just see the white t-shirt and the ponytail. That's Jesse James. He was our head of security then. Oh, yeah. Shit. That's yeah. cool. So, he started his fender business after like six months after he got injured stage diving at a, one of our shows in Detroit. So we sent him home and he couldn't come out with us. He started welding these fenders. And next thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so John, I was just wondering though, before joining Sam Hain, were you, had you heard or were you a fan of the Misfits or Glad? I or? My friends and I, would would beat up punk rockers we didn't like them <laughs> yeah i was from the the heavy metal grit crew right we we wore the the open flannels with the black t-shirts and the cigarettes and we rolled them up in our sleeves and we were a bunch of pussies but we thought we were tough but we knew we were, we knew we were tougher than the punkers right right and, and the punkers were all wearing the crimson ghost t-shirts and all that kind of stuff and missed okay. it i'd heard of them but i couldn't sing any of the songs you know Tell us about like the origin of the Power and Fury Orchestra. Was that something that that Rick Rubin designed, or you know, came up with the idea? Was that Glenn, or you know, and then and and the song? Uh, so yeah. So that all right. So that goes back to the Power and Fury Orchestra was actually the first recordings of Sam Hain with the new lineup pre Danzig. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so maybe the name Danzig had been floated around, but it wasn't totally official yet. Um, so Rick was um, music director for the movie Less Than Zero. Right. right. Uh, what is it, Robert Downey Jr.? Yeah. yeah. It was Brett, uh, uh, Brett, Brett Easton Ellis wrote the novel. And it was based off of the... I, I, I don't care who wrote the novel. The movie... Uh was what's important no i appreciate your knowledge no i'm just i'm just messing with you um yes yeah, so robert, robert downey jr yeah robert downey jr and who is it? matthew uh andrew no andrew mccarthy, McCarthy. robert downey andrew jr. mccarthy and jamie, jamie gertz jamie gertz exactly Check right out. I'm gonna make so a they were um Great. less so he was zero. in la working on this music so we were desperate trying to get him into the rehearsal studio to do, finish our pre-production so we could get into the studio and get recording and yeah. he was constantly in L.A. for weeks at a time. And then he would come back to Manhattan for a couple of days or a week. And we would maybe get a rehearsal. In. And this was like grinding over the summer. And um, so it was finally like, you know, July. And we we're like, Rick, you know, what's the deal? And he says, man, I'm trying to get this movie done, trying to get this movie done. I need a few more songs. Uh, what do you think? And Glenn was like, well, you know, we can do some tracking for you. and 
Glenn and Rick were big Roy Orbison fans. Yeah. Maybe we could get Roy to sing a song or write a song. So then the idea of Glenn and Roy working together on a song that Glenn would write, Roy would sing it, and we would be the backing band for it. <laughs> so they just called us the Power and Fury Orchestra. Okay, okay. And so there was like You and Me, that was one song, and the other one was yeah. Less Than Zero, right? So we recorded the backing tracks, the, the, the actual soundtrack stuff for that. And then they went in and laid, over, laid vocals over that. So we helped Rick finish that movie a little bit sooner so he could come back, go right into studio, start pre-production with us at CBS. That's finally, we finally got to sign contracts. I remember we were lying on the rehearsal room floor with our pens and our little contracts for CBS, nervously signing our signatures, you know, Chaka Khan yeah, yeah. was in the studio across the hall and we were trying to get stuff going. And that's, that's how the Power and Fury Orchestra started. Now did you, so that's you and Erie and Chuck doing the backing tracks on that Roy Orbison song? Yep. That, and I, think Glenn, I think Glenn played some piano on that too. Wow, that's cool. Yep. And then you and me, that, that's the, the song, that, to Sir With Love, right? I mean, that's that song just with different lyrics, isn't it? No, it's slightly different, but it's basically... It's a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't a direct ripoff of that. It was, that was more or less Glenn wanting to do his own kind of crooning out of okay. respect to Roy. I see, yeah. Or, or, yeah. or you know, kind of an homage, because, you know, he could hit some longer notes and he could get that throaty thing where he changed the tone as he went oh, and it jumps up you know yeah that, right right emotional thing right so that's what that was about okay um that's going funny. back real quick to sam hayne now when you first joined where was final descent was that the songs for that was that already written and then oh, you no, the no, that didn't even, no that didn't exist whatsoever Wow. Okay. So they yeah. just put out um, November Coming Fire, and that was after. Then you joined after that. Yeah. So there were some garbage tracks from November Coming Fire. Yeah. And we did go into a local studio in Lodi, New Jersey, and I laid down a couple of rhythm tracks and maybe one or two lead tracks. And I remember Glenn had this tiny little Galian Kruger amp that he loved that sounded good in the studio. And I'd looked around for you. I never could find that same amp, but he had one and it sounded pretty cool. So I did go in and do a, a session. I think I was playing his Les Paul Jr. or something, but it never got put out, not for years and years. It finally did come out later yeah. on. Um, and that was never intended for Danzig. That was just part of his Sam Hain collection. He said, okay, I'm going to shelve it and we'll put it out later on. Okay. And you did all the solos on that. Did you do all the guitar stuff or is that Glenn doing Not all, No, I think some of the stuff he'd already started and tracked before. Yeah. And then we finished and added some more stuff in Hollywood Sound in LA back in like 1992. So, you know, I was first up there in 88, right? We were playing yeah. around in New Jersey. And then we had some time. I think it was after Lucifuge that we went in and just messed around and, and did some of that stuff. Okay, well, that's cool. How did it feel moving from New York to living in California, signed and being one of the famous bands of the world, having your music everywhere? How did you? How did that feel? The women were so much better looking in California. I couldn't <laughs> <laughs> you know, we knew that the, there were there were issues with the move. All right, we, it was a shock when we realized that Rick and Russell Simmons were gonna split up Def Jam because we really loved the people at Def Jam. You know, um, we didn't know who was gonna go to California, who was gonna stay in New York, who was gonna stay with Russell, who was gonna go with Rick, okay? And uh, because we, were, we would go down to the Def Jam offices um, you know, in the village, like once a week, a couple times a month, pick up our little advance paychecks, you know, and uh, talk to everybody there. Um, George Draculius was always hanging out down there. Um, he's the guy who discovered the Black Crows. And he, he was a friend of Rick Rubin's at NYU. He used to do his laundry and, and was a sidekick. And they, they were still friends when we went to LA. Um, there are a couple of other guys 
uh, that were there. So we were nervous. And also um, when Def Jam split, um, the, de the deal with CBS, Columbia was gone. Hmm. So we were without a contract until we renegotiated with Rick and Deaf American and Geffen when we moved to LA. So I was nervous as hell. Yeah. What's, what's gonna happen next? And at this point, our songs weren't on the radio. A little bit they were. Mother was the first single and we worked it hard and we did get some airplay. The best we did was, you know, our first tour, real tour. Uh, we did a couple six day tours with Slayer and stuff like that. But our first real tour was a UK tour with Metallica. And we did 14 dates in the UK in 88. We started in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, we were going in the back door to the gig, coming down the driveway. And if there are about a thousand fans outside, they thought our minivan was Metallica's. <laughs> they stopped us. They were pushing and shaking it. I thought they were going to roll it over. Security had to form a human tunnel so we could just jump from the van through the human tunnel into the back of the club. And I saw people holding up our Danzig vinyl. In the States, it was only on CD. It wasn't on, I'd never seen the vinyl. I'd never seen the gatefold oh. until wow. I, got cool. I saw the first gatefold. I was like, holy crap, do you guys see that? And uh, and so when we were opening up for Metallica, I was like, oh shit, man, this is real. This is That's the big cool. We were up in Belfast, Ireland, like our 12th show or something. <laughs> And um, they pulled the fire alarm during, the, during our concert. It was like our fourth song in, right? It was a great show going on. Pulled the fire alarm. We had to go off stage. They were spitting on us when we came back. I was covered with huge loogies. These people rolled their own cigarettes. They all had changed the season colds. It was disgusting, right? I mean, I'm playing a C, and I'm getting ready to go play an E, and somebody hops a big loogie up on E right where I got to go. What can I do? I just got to go right there. I go back to C and it just leaves this yellow trail all the way down. I had stains uh. on my hands. So anyway, we cut the set short because Metallica had to get on and do their show. We went back to the hotel. They came back. We're sitting in the lobby having a couple of beers. Their tour manager comes in and goes, hey, guess what? And Justice for All has just hit number six on the Billboard charts. Huh. We had a massive party in the lobby. And yes, things did get broken <laughs> that's how it should be <laughs> are, are, like are we talking like television someone just getting bars furniture. of soap yeah furniture bars of soap so let's just say that unfortunately, unfortunately one of the cars that got turned over happened to be one of the waitresses that worked there <laughs> oh, I hope you tipped her wow. well. <laughs> so, so a memo came down that Metallica and Danzig can no longer play in the same sandbox. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. So That's cool. So, all right. Well, let's fast forward it now. Now, I want to discuss some of the music making videos because I was watching the video. Wait, the ask me how it felt. It all felt right. great. It felt so. Hold that thought. That question. Got One it. of my favorite memories ever is I had a friend who was living in Hollywood. And we were out there to do a show at the Palladium, opening up for Slayer. It was on Entertainment Tonight. They oversold the show. There were 200 fans outside with tickets that couldn't get in. They smashed the windows, threw rocks at the cars. They called the riot police out. And uh, it made Entertainment Tonight. Danzig opening up for Slayer. Uh, on my way home, I'm in the car with my friend. He's driving an old white 82 Camaro. And mother comes on KNEC 105.5 in LA. And it was the first time I've ever heard it on the radio. And I was like, wow, that's badass. Your music sounds different on the radio than it does anywhere else. Yeah. It has there's a certain there's a certain compression that goes on when it goes through the radio and comes back out. And it just has this smoothness, this denseness to it that was that was sweet. Then I felt like, wow, man, I've arrived. Oh, all right. No, actually, I just Barrett, you experienced that with that guy from jail that loved your album. <laughs> yeah, yeah John, that, was, that happened. Yeah. Yeah, John. Uh, Baron plays in a band, a punk band with my older brother, and like some guy from jail got a hold of his album and sent Barrett like a fan mail. So, did you guys get a lot of fan mail too? I'm sure you guys did. Yeah. When um, 
when they first opened up our fan club in California, I think it was 1992. Yeah, I think it was 1992. We, um, 91, no, it, no, it was 91 because the Gulf War was starting. And we started getting, I started getting fan mail from Marines and soldiers that were playing Danzig's first album, and My Demon, when they went into tank battles. Wow. Hey, they gosh. kept playing that song over and over and over. And Twisted Cane, they were playing it on the aircraft carriers and on the flight deck. And there were guys, special forces in the Philippines that were sending me pictures from the Philippines. And I was like, you got to be kidding me, man. This, I mean, it just blew me away that they had, and they were cassettes. You know, they didn't yeah, have, right. they, they were on cassette. And uh, they were they were fighting with our music, man. Wow, that's amazing. All right, that so back to my all right, so back to the videos. So when you guys were making these music videos, bodies, mother, she rides, like what was did Glenn come up with the concepts? Because I was watching the video to bodies, and it's just like four half naked girls dancing when you guys are jamming. Like I cannot see a guy be like. All right, guys, this beer's gonna be awesome. I got chicks, I got boobs, and I got a band. Let's go. Like, what was the they did four different versions of that video? There's four different versions. Same with uh, the one from Danzig Four. Um, John, you probably know more about this than I do. Um, the I don't mind the pain. Is so, the G rated, the PG, and then the R rated, X rated. Oh, let, let's let's go back. Let's go back right. to the first mother video. It was banned on MTV. Right. The chicken thing, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was banned. Okay. So that was that was fun. That was uh, Rick Rubin had a buddy. I think his name was Rick Manello. He did commercials and stuff. Another NYU guy, a film guy. And uh, so he had some basic concepts and some models, you know, for that sort of thing. Glenn wanted to do the pentagram thing and he wanted to rip the chicken open, you know. He was really into the the Santa Ria thing, and um, God, what was the movie that came out in New Orleans? Mickey Rourke. Uh, oh, uh, Bonet, Mickey Rourke. Yeah, uh, I know what you're talking about. Oh, uh, we were, you know, he was into this movie and and this kind of stuff, so he wanted to do, you know, something a little off, and uh, so he put that in there, and then they they brought a handful of different models out and threw up some screens and, and it was just kind of like a silly slap together thing. Uh, and it kind of worked, you know, uh, got us through. She Rides was sort of the breakthrough video. For I me. love that. I love that video. Um, and the girl with um, the brown hair and the nice legs. High five me. You're nipple bumping me. There <laughs> yeah. <you. laughs> yeah, She Rides is like one of my favorite music videos of all time. So there was a thing, we ended up doing two versions of it, right? We did the first version and it didn't come out as well as we'd like. So when we were in LA, we got another girl to take the lead part in that. And she became Glenn's girlfriend for a couple of years. You know, the redhead, the sultry yeah. redhead and everything. And, uh, and that's when that one really started working. Um, as far as the other videos, bodies and all that kind of stuff, how the gods kill, uh, that was much later bodies. That was sort of an afterthought that we said, all right, we got some extra time. We got some models. We'll throw them together. It'll just be kind of like a studio jam thing and lots of flashes of all that low production cost. We're going to spend more money on how the gods kill with the big eager headpiece that the blonde is wearing and all that sort of thing. Yeah, well, I got a question uh, for you, John. Uh, during my research, I found out that after Danzig, you made music for pornography. Is this the Dark true? Brothers? The Dark Brothers, yes. Okay. And so when I was doing my research, I found out that Eddie Van Halen did the same thing. You know what it is? It's like, it's it's horrible though because you think it's going to be this cool thing and you get in there and then you're all excited and you're watching and you're doing coming up with music and then 
like eight hours into it you've been there done that and then it's like oh, i can't watch any more of this crap and you still yeah. you got to put out like each scene is like 24 minutes long. So you got to come up with a 24 minute song for yeah. each scene. How, you can't solo for 24 minutes. My right. wife wishes I could go for 24 minutes. If you know exactly, what I mean. right? <laughs> so, these guys are from another planet anyway. They, they, you know, they, they, they breed them in test tubes and then they do all this kind of stuff to pump them up. No pun intended. But at the time, so it was like, you know, I was under pressure to get this stuff finished i think it was uh, dark brothers they did a lot of stuff with um the brazilian mob so you didn't say no you just finished it and then you collect right. your paycheck so i did new wave hookers three and four but i didn't tell anybody about it until now yep so, what about so, part five they're just like john christ can't do pot part five no i was into i was into the fourth version and um i just i got busy with another project i didn't want to finish it so they brought in another guy to finish it and i just kind of backed out quietly and said all right don't want to do that again you know <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> for a minute but you know it just wasn't my thing john one thing that i've always wondered and i know a lot of other people have to just talk to us about the songwriting process and danzig did danzig did glenn come with the songs like already written and arranged or did he just come with you with the Here's the lyrics. And yeah. have you come up with the stuff? Like I've always wondered. So, so I'll I'll give you an example. Um, mother. Yeah. In early rehearsals, when Glenn first showed me mother, this is what mother was. <laughs> is that better? Perfect, perfect. That was it. That was Mother. Didn't have a chorus or anything. It was just this fast punk rock thing. And then it was just. OK. OK. We got in the studio with Rick, and he was like, you know what? Let's kind of make it a little bit bluesier. He had just, he'd finished working with the cult. They did the electric album, and they did it uh -huh. in Electric Lady Studios in Greenwich Village. They were in there recording their cover of uh, Born to be Wild. I think, uh, yeah, Born to be Wild, I think they did a cover of it. So they were going for that ACDC snare drum sound, and Glenn and that singer had similar crooning styles, right? So Glenn was there, Rick Rubin was there, George Reculius was there, it might have been one or two other guys. So we started playing around with uh, changing it, because I like to play th things in lower position, and I, instead of just playing a regular B chord, I like to put the fifth on the bottom so it gives it a fuller sound. Yeah. And then so we broke it up to. And they were like, eh, not so much R&B funk, you know, take the right hand slap out of it, clean it up a little bit. And then it was like. And then in the studio, we added the overdub. But I had to add that back in to the main part live. So it went. so it started getting the feel and then the chorus first it was it was all bar chords you know it was like it still had all this chugging going on and and rick was like nah you know let's make it ring think angus young so it was like Put the fifth back in. And then add my own chug.
and then the fill, boom, tap, 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 that was totally, right, right. that drum fill was Rick Rubin. Oh, that, was, oh, that was Rick's drum fill. Chuck didn't come up with that. Rick came up with that. Chuck duplicated it. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. We, I, I didn't really like doing the video process because it was a lot of intense head banging um, over and over and over for a day. But then you got that process out of the way and you knew, okay, we're going to get an advance soon and then it's going to be rehearsals and then we're going to be on the road. Then it's smooth sailing. So that was kind of what life was. It was like, I'm broke. When does the advance come? You know, when do we do the videos? When are we going to get on the road? For the first three tours, my guitar techs made more than twice what I made. It's just the way it was, you know. But my bills were paid in advance. I could send money home. My job was to play guitar and meet groupies, and uh, I tried to excel at both. Do you think it's possible you could play Devil's Plaything on the acoustic guitar for me, dude? The acoustic part? Yeah, give me a sec. like that there's one more this is the original guitar for John, for songs like those, did Glenn come to you with them already written and arranged, or did you come up with them? 
we we put that one together. He said, okay, I want to do a blues song called I'm the One. It's going to be based off of some of the old Delta Blues stuff. You know, we want to get this type of Howlin' Wolf type of, you know, like, um, sorry. Can only take so much of a beating, right? <laughs> so, you know, that, um, that Willie Dixon type of style yeah. yeah but not quite as busy you know so that's where it's just and to make it evil you heard in the chorus where I actually slow down it starts up it starts up normal and when he starts going I slow it down a little bit and start doing like the Stevie Ray Vaughan rake so I'm going Answer your question completely yeah. yeah he would come in with the original motifs the original lick you know okay i want to do a song and it's going to start like and then we would put the whole thing together her black wings was like you know that song zero the hero off the black sabbath album oh yeah yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. okay so with that that and then we're going to make it bigger you know, but I want it to like really growl when it comes into the chorus. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, yeah, yeah, but now throw some chords in. And I said, all right, how about this? And he said, but I want the chorus to open up real big and be kind of bluesy. So. I would turn into the human loop machine. I would just keep throwing out slight variations like. He's like, nah, that ain't it. And I go, yeah, let me add some harmony to that. We said, okay, just chug for a while. He said, maybe I'll come in after four, maybe I'll come after six. So we would just play around with it. He'd call me on the phone with a, a little micro cassette recorder and he would play it into the phone. I'd put the receiver down on the other end near my ear. I would pick up this guitar in my apartment, listen to what he was doing, try and learn the part, get it into my head and then play back stuff. And then he would take it from there and then we would come and work it out at rehearsal. And sometimes he would come in with songs Ideas for songs, some rhythm, you know, like. Oh, wait a minute, that's not it. Uh, it sounds like a lot of them. Uh, let's see. Um... He might have that and nothing else, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I would come in and fill out all the other parts, or we would bring it to the band. And then we turn the band into a loop machine and I would just keep playing alternative versions and stuff. And it was either thumbs up or thumbs down. We had a dual cassette boom box that we would play that had high speed dubbing in it. And we would just record our rehearsals on a stupid cassette player and we would high speed dub copies for everybody to go home, digest it. And that was part of our pre-production writing process. We didn't do much or any writing on the road. It was all at home. Okay. okay. John, could you please play Baron's favorite song, How the Gods Kill? He would really love to hear that right now. Could you please do that for us? Sure. So 
that was my favorite one because I I actually got a budget to <laughs> to to rent equipment and uh, rent equipment, rent guitars. So for this, the beginning sound of this. Um, So I rented one of Jeff Beck's old strats for that clean oh, sound man. from uh, Brower Studio Rentals in the Valley. in the loud part but when it comes yeah, yeah. to the last yeah, yeah. part Thank you so much for taking a lot of your time yeah. with us. Yeah, thank you, know you for your busy. time. Yep, thank you, John. It's been a pleasure. Thanks yeah. for being honest with us with everything. And uh, we can see maybe if you got time in a couple of weeks, if we can do like a follow up. John, I want you to promote what you got going on. Oh, I think oh. I'm going to start doing some guitar clinics. And also, I'm teaching online. I'm going to revamp my website. I'm going to start launching probably some subscription lessons. I, I want to teach. A lot of people want to learn. Danzig one, two, and three, and four on guitar the right way from the guy who recorded it. Exactly. So, uh, if somebody wants to pay me five, ten grand for a couple of days, uh, they fly me out. I'll do. <laughs> get, get the rich sheiks in Dubai. They want to spend some of their oil money. I'm happy to help them out. <laughs> and I'm also going to start doing probably some workshops, clinics for the more normal people. You know, for like four or five hundred bucks, come to my place in Maryland for a day and hang out, jam, learn some Danzig stuff, hear some of the old road stories. Thank you, guys. Take care.